Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. Unfortunately, Dr. Kaiser could not be with us, but we do have ITE FAU student chapter and representatives from FAU. I'm gonna pass this on to Itilio to give an introduction for our speaker. Uh, okay, so good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, before the presentation, I'm just gonna give a quick bio from uh, Mr. Vijay Agraval. So, Vijay is a professional civil engineer with 23 years of experience in global parts, freight, and intermodal transportation infrastructure development projects with emphasis on efficiency improvement, emissions reduction, and optimization of capital and operating costs of moving freight and people. He has led and worked on more than 60 parts and intermodal projects worldwide for, develop, for development of efficient movement of cargo and people. Jay has worked across all major parts in the US with recent experience in Georgia, South Carolina, Port Miami, Port Houston, Port of Corpus Christi, Port of New Orleans, and Wilmington. He leads ACOM Parts Asset Management Initiative and Technology Solutions, offering clients new and innovative ways to manage part assets and optimize terminal operations by undertaking simulation modeling services. Vijay is currently serving as the chair on the ASCE Coasts, Oceans, Parts, and Rivers Institute Asset Management Condition Assessment Subcommittee and advisory board member for the Center for Advances in Part Management in Lamar University and for the Brower College, the Supply Chain Management Program, which is bringing part industry knowledge to academia. Um, Okay, so Mr. Vijay, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you um, <clears throat> for that introduction. My name is Vijay. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can um, scan the QR code that will take you to my LinkedIn page. So you can uh, connect with me. If you have any question, my email address will be also given at the end. I'm not sure about your old background in, in, in the ports or how much you know about it. So feel free to stop um, and ask a question if you have any, any question. I have a um, lot of content, uh, but we have a short time. So we will try to go, go quick. Just try to capture as I speak the trend so when we say about trend, trend in container terminals, so first of all, make sure you understand a very important element of the, the complete supply chain um, that we see all around us. Um, containers were invented, if you know, in mid fifties. It's been only 70, 60 years in the whole history of humanity where we have, we have containers. Before that, everything moved by bulk, okay? It's still, there is still a lot of goods that move by bulk, but it's the containerization that completely changed the landscape of what can be moved and where it can be moved because it standardizes the processes. Only after containerization, the global trade really took off. Okay, so keep that in mind, the imp importance of this, this, this subject. Over the many years that, um, I have been working. Um, I was a student just like you in Lamar University. I, I studied civil engineering in India. I studied more civil engineering in the US. And then um, I landed a job for a, for a small boutique firm who was doing port planning and container terminals, operations, analysis, simulation modeling. I knew nothing about ports, I knew nothing about containers, nothing about this topic, but it all existed. So it's, it's 
I really appreciate um, FAU and the IT chapter for giving this opportunity to all of you to learn about the industry. Um, it has a huge impact as we all saw during the pandemic and post pandemic. Um, you all must have heard about supply chain and this, this subject is kind of at the heart of, of, of that supply chain. So we'll, we'll capture a um, you know, couple of topics. We will talk about container terminals so you get a better idea about what is a container terminal, um, different types of modes they operate in, how did the ship size evolve and the impact of the ship size. We'll speak briefly about the automation trends and, and the future trends for you all to, to learn about and, and become part of this industry as you graduate and um, come back in, in, in the industry. So a terminal is where a ship will come, drop off and pick up containers and then leave. And those containers get picked up by trucks or the rail, right? So that's pretty much your container terminal. So that, that facility where all these transactions happen is a container terminal. And a good terminal would of course enable any size ship to, to come. There are no restrictions in terms of the size. It has a good connectivity with road, rail, it has a lot of um, electric power because it consumes a lot of electric power. And there are not too many people live nearby because when there is no port, everybody wants a port. As soon as you have a port, nobody wants a port because of the light, the impact of light, noise, traffic, that industrialization you know, starts to impact the neighbors. So, you know, it has to work within um, the social framework. <clears throat> For any given terminal, um, several things has to work. Um, it should um, be able to store those containers when, when a ship comes. You are dropping off five to 8,000 containers sometimes in one day, and that takes a lot of space. And you have to know exactly where is each container because there is hundreds of thousands of dollars worth stuff in it. Um, and there is, there is a, there is a um, responsibility that is being carried by the operator, right? Um, you have to have enough lighting, the, the facility should be able to drain, it should be safe. Um, it should um, have the right equipment mix um, and it should have enough area for, for the trucks in the rail, queuing, etc. So um, this is kind of a quick uh, flow chart. Um, this is <laughs> that shows the typical transaction of uh, um, of inside a container terminal. A ship gets worked by cranes. Um, they bring the container inside the terminal. There is another crane that picks up the container, puts it in the stack. And then later on, when an outside truck comes in, it 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 comes in, comes in and then picks up the container. So there are many ways, as you can think about. It's like um, it's like a Lego Lego game, right? You can stake these containers in so many different ways, and you can handle them so many different ways. And remember. Unlike Legos, these are heavy boxes. Each box is like 15 to 20 tons, 15 to 20 tons. So you need specific type of cranes. Um, building of these facilities are very expensive, almost two to four million dollars per acre. So if you just want a one acre terminal, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to build it. Equipment is very expensive. So 
a lot of planning. We as civil engineers, planners, um, do a lot of work trying to optimize um, the flow of containers, equipment, um, so it is safe and efficient. So with that background, let's quickly look at, just to get a better idea, you will see, you know, when the containerization happened, this is the, this is the mode that everybody was using. When I say mode means how do you store a container inside the terminal yard? So here containers are just stored on a chassis, right? So when, when, a, when a ship came, it, it just, the crane just put a container on the chassis and it's just waiting for the trucks to come in, hook it up and leave. So this is a wheel storage, but you can see this is low density. You cannot stack on, on one on top of another. Um, but also the beauty of this concept, if you have land, a lot of land, you don't need another piece of equipment. A truck driver can just come in, hook it up and leave. You don't need another crane to hand off the container. So it's, it's a cheapest but lowest density option. Many terminals start out like that, but as the demand grew, they started stacking them upward using a crane called RTG. This is a very standard name in the industry, rubber tire gantry equipment, which means these cranes are portal cranes. You can see um, they, um, they have rubber, rubber tires, just like cars, and they are a portal frame. They, they will just straddle over the stack, pick up the container, and then deliver the container to the truck, who is just going to go in. You can see in the, in, on the left-hand side how this RTG picks up a container, drops it off, or pick it up and put it in the stack. So that's an RTG crane. Majority of the worldwide terminals are using RTG. RTG is like your Toyota or Honda of the car world. It's pretty much everybody drives it. Um, but they are diesel, diesel equipment. So keep that in mind. So they started um, electrifying because of emissions that, that gets generated from the diesel equipment. So they started electrifying this machine. So you can connect them using a bus bar system or a cable reel system. Cable reel has a, has a big cable wheel. And as it moves, it just reels the cable, uh, which feeds the power to this crane. That, that was an RTG. But RTG is a bit more expensive. So a lot of container terminals, smaller ones you will see in Miami, in Caribbean, um, island countries, Latin countries in Latin America, many of them use the top picks and risk takers. Um, they are um, less expensive, more, um, more flexible. They do require more space to maneuver and they also can only service from one side of the stack. It cannot just go up and then pick up a container. So it's less efficient from, from that perspective, but it's cheaper. Um, when a container is empty, this equipment side pick is, is used. Um, it can go up to six to seven or up to eight high. You can see just by picking up a container from side, it's less heavy container because it's an empty container. So um, there is um, less risk of um, you know, turning moment uh, and stability issue. Um, However, this cannot be used for a, for a loaded container. So that's the limitation of this, this side peak um, equipment. Then there is a unique uh, equipment called straddle carrier. Straddle carrier is just like RTG, but it only straddles over one single container. So it can just go inside the stack you have to have enough space between the two container stacks for this equipment to come in. The beauty of this equipment, this is one of my favorite, favorite equipment because this is a lifter as well as transporter, which means straddle carrier does not need a truck to move a container within the terminal. 
it can come pick it up and go by itself so it reduces it decouples the two equipment has to be in one place it decouples their transaction so more efficient um, so recently last 15 years the trend has been automation this is a snapshot of an automated staking crane it's very similar to rtg but because it is automated it is moving on a on a rail so you can see a, a steel rail and and the and, and this portal frame machine moves over the steel frame and it is electrically powered so this is a very um, latest trend most of the european terminals are going towards asc system uh, us is also picking up uh, with almost four terminals now uh, using asc systems one second okay So one of the issue that the industry had to solve was um, when ASC, which is automated crane, is servicing a truck, there is a safety issue <clears throat> because, <clears throat> because of the labor union um, rules and safety, at least in the US, the driver has to come out. He stands here on a pad the system knows driver is out, then only the, the crane will do a last final transaction. Most of these AC cranes are operated by um, people sitting away from the equipment in a safer building. They can use the cameras installed on the crane with the system you all may be familiar during playing games. Uh, my 13 year old plays games very well. He can lift off a lot of thing using a jockey. And that's a good skill to have because you can transfer those skills into container handling industry. Um, in fact, I just visited a couple months ago. You can check it on my LinkedIn page. I, I posted um, my visit to Lam Bank Terminal in Thailand where all the cranes are remotely operated, um, pretty neat. And one of the best operator is a handicapped woman, actually a young girl, 22, 23 years old, who cannot go on top of the crane, but she's able to work from an office environment, a remote controlled crane. And she's one of the best um, operator, pretty Pretty fascinating. Some other variations of, of cranes. Um, this is called an RMG, rail mounted gantry. So all ASCs are by nature RMG. <coughs> this is a cantilever RMG. So it has a cantilever on both sides. It's a very big machine, five to $6 million each. But this one is configured so it can service a rail track on, on one side and truck on another side. So you can do various combination. Uh, it segregates the workflow uh, a bit more safe, electrically powered um, machine. <clears throat> one of the key um, element of the terminal operations is terminal tractors. This is a, this is a terminal tractors. Unlike what you see on the street, which is a chassis, Chassis has a pin. So when you put a container on a chassis, the pin will lock into the hall of a container. Whereas within a terminal, the chassis they use is called bobtails in the US or a terminal tractor. You can see it has a flare. It doesn't have a corner, um, corner pin, it, it has a flare. So it's easy to just slide the container on it and then move it in other part of the of the yard, very important machine. And this is one of the goal recently is to electrify this equipment, but as you can see, it's carrying huge loads. So um, we still have to see which company, if not Tesla is gonna come up with, with a good terminal tractors with a good range uh, and capacity. 
but depending on what type of equipment you use, you can get a different types of density, right? Density is how many containers you can store in that 100 acre, 50 acre space. And because it's so expensive to build a new space, the trend is to go from left to right. So wheeled, the, the one we saw gives you low density, but as you go towards ASCs, you can see how compact you can get. But as you go towards the right, it also becomes more expensive. The equipment becomes more expensive. The system becomes more expensive. So you have to do that business case analysis, which equipment makes more sense for, for a given terminal. So all this is happening because of the, the ship size. Um, it has been evolving faster than anything else <clears throat> that I have seen in the industry. And nowadays we have container ships. If you are in Miami, you, are, you may have seen, you know, Royal Caribbean, Carnival, Norwegian, all these cruise ships, which are the top of the class, um, Oasis class, Dream class, but that trend is recent trend. Container ships trend is, is stronger <clears throat> and more long-term trend where those ships are getting really bigger. And because a sh if ship is big, it also brings more containers on top of it. <clears throat> you have to have those cranes and these cranes are 400 tons, 500 tons, 2000 tons capacity cranes so everything has to change and everything is so expensive so you have to plan ahead what type of ship you will be able to service in the future you can see how as the vessel size a teu in a container world is is a very standard unit is 20 feet equivalent unit because the containers are in 20 feet size, 40 feet, 45, 53, how do you know how many containers one is handling versus another? So TEU is a, is a common unit. So convert everything into 20 feet and that's your TEU. So 24,000 TEU ship means that ship can carry 24,000 containers on it. And you can see as the, as the ship size is increasing, the width of the, the ship increases, length also increases, the depth also increases. But you also have to keep in mind, there are only two locks through which the ships can transit, Panama Canal and Suez Canal. Panama Canal opened a third, third lock, so it has a width limitation and Suez Canal has its own uh, limitation, but it's more, you know, it's able to allow bigger ships. So all that plays into the size of the ship that, that are coming in the market. This is, um, this is how, as the ship size increases, you can see it draws more water because it's heavy, right? The more weight you put on it, it's gonna go deeper in the water. So the buoyancy has to be balanced. But you cannot go keep going deeper because digging ocean is the most expensive, most expensive activity also has impact on, you know, natural environment. So you can see how it has plateaued out at about 52 to 50, 55 feet, but nobody knows if it's going to go further, further deeper. So two capture all these trends and you know um, everything is getting expensive as you know uh, the labor is very expensive in the US market um, capex is very expensive um, you know overall so um, industry has been automating a lot of the functions and also safety it's not safe when you have a human interacting with, with these machines who are moving in a very high velocity, high density, high congestion area, right? So you're gonna move the people away from this equipment. So from all those issues and also utilizing this asset, if you have 
a $5 million asset sitting in a terminal, you wanna keep using it. But if you have human drivers who have two times and three times pay going from first shift to second shift to third shift, it becomes very expensive to run it in, in the nighttime. So a lot of terminals in the, in the Europe have started doing 24 seven operation using automation. Uh, and these equipment are also electric because in order to automate it, you have to electrify it um, for that reliability and also increase capacity. Um, I, I, I mentioned this, there are several um, labor unions in the US market. ILWU is operating on the West Coast, ILA operates on the East Coast in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, many times, historically, they have gone on strikes at the impact of shutting down the terminals. As soon as you shut down the container terminal, there is a complete downstream fallback effect on the whole supply chain. So that reliability um, has been an issue, um, but you know some form of automation um, has taken care of that that um, issue to some extent. But there is more to be done. You can see this is a quick summary of you know, automated terminals worldwide. Most of them are using um, ASCs, right? Majority of those terminals have trended towards using ASCs. Some are using cantilever RMGs. Some have automated using RTGs, electric RTGs. Uh, some are also using straddle carriers. Um, and then some combination of strads with ASCs is also is so going there. You can see the trend. The first one, the first automated terminal was inaugurated in 93. The time when I entered uh, my engineering, um, civil engineering bachelor's, I, I entered uh, in 93, but you can see since then, the trend is, is only going up and there's a lot more to, to be done. This is a nice shot of um, a terminal in Virginia, um, Norfolk, Virginia. This was opened in 2006. So pretty early on, USA had um, a semi-automated container terminal. I call it semi-automated because only partial equipment is automated. Other equipments are not automated. Everything is not automated. Um, here only these yard cranes were automated. The key or STS cranes, which work off the ship, they were not automated. Even equipment that moves, a truck that moves a container from a key crane to the CY crane, they were not automated. So, but this was early on. You can see this is the land side and the other, other side is the water side. And the main, the most important feature of an ASC terminal, you should be able to spot it right away is they are perpendicular to the wharf. You can see that the staking is perpendicular to the wharf. That's how an ASC terminal operates. It segregates the land side and the water side. This is another nice shot of uh, London Gateway Terminal. Um, the neat thing, um, AECOM is the designer for, for this facility. Uh, my colleagues worked on it. But here, this is a, there is an innovation um, where instead of paving everything with, a, with the asphalt or concrete, we kept the, the pavement minimal with aggregates in, in between. So it's a nice civil engineering innovation where you reduce the, the concrete use, you use more natural drainage. Um, another one in Jibel Ali, Dubai. Dubai is a big, big, big hub in container logistics, uh, servicing the, the Middle East. Um, and we do a lot of work in Dubai. Um, huge cranes, but this, they use uh, a double cantilever RMG system. 
um, so they can segregate human drivers because in Dubai, the, the labor cost is still lower than the US or European countries. So this element of transferring container from wharf to the CY was not automated, right? Because this labor is still more cost effective. So you can see a variation. This is a nice shot of RTG, so rubber tired machine, but this is an automated machine. Um, the problem with RTG getting automated is if your pavement is not good, as, as, as the wheel starts going back and forth, back and forth, they will lose the alignment. Even with the slightest misalignment, the automation gets tricky, right? So that's why they are not preferred. But now I, I think the equipment manufacturers have come up with enough sensors to realign automatically as it drifts away. So um, this is a nice shot of Trapec terminal in Los Angeles. Ola is port of Los Angeles which combines the ASCs. This is a nice variation of ASC. The ASCs are parallel to the wharf and they are fed by, by auto struts. This is my favorite combination because this little machine is completely automated. It's, there is nobody on it and it just knows where to go, drop it off, go keep doing it. It can move containers from the wharf to the CY in the interchange area. The AC is also automated. It will come pick it up and then put it back. So nice, nice feature there. This is the latest automated container terminal in the port of Long Beach, LBCT container terminal. <clears throat> so a similar scheme, but here, you can see you have to get more organized, right? As you go automation of anything, you have to become more organized. You cannot have random events. You want to minimize random events. So there is an appointment system. Once trucker gets through the gate, he comes here, waits. The system knows through CCTV, OCR technology, RFID technology, the truck is here. It will send the message to the yard. So a lot of coordination happens before the transaction can happen. So this is the problem, right, with, with, with automation. When, when a street truck brings a container, it's a street chassis. And street chassis, as I said, has, has a pin. And a container corner casting is locked with that pin. So somebody has to physically unlock it before a crane, especially if it is an automated crane. And sometimes we have seen, you know, driver forgets to unlock it or it did not unlock. You can see what happens. That's why safety is paramount. And that's why getting the driver out of the cab um, is still important. <clears throat> so these equipment now are, are getting electrified. Um, huge battery powered um, AGVs. This, this equipment is called AGV, Automated Guided Vehicle. Um, and, uh, you know, it's electrically charged. Um, this is a nice snapshot of auto shred, also battery operated auto shred with some kind of recharging system coming up in the industry. I briefly mentioned about union. So the contracts have to uh, take into account what are the existing you know, terms and conditions with the union. <clears throat> this is a quick summary of the automate automation projects in the US. I mentioned Virginia, New Jersey had one in 2014. You saw the traffic one combination of ASCs and auto strad. LBCT opened up in 2016. And the recent one we are we are working on this right now in, in Los Angeles for APM terminals at PF 400. 
which only uses, you can see, auto threads. There is no ASC. So they are one over three high auto thread. Pretty neat combination. Um, so as you, you know, electrify and automate this terminal, you um, you have to consider several issues during the design of the facility. Um, is there enough power capacity um, coming from the power plant? Um, you have to look at, um, you know, what is the connectivity, connectivity with the grid, their capacity, et cetera. Um, big issues because the, the power plants were not sized for feeding huge power to terminals. So a lot of terminals are implementing renewable energy measures like solar power on big buildings, you know, warehouses, administration building, parking areas um, is, is becoming very common. Um, some innovative ways of generating power uh, in or nearby port facilities. Also, the wind um, wind is also becoming very popular. It has been popular. Um, there is huge, huge, huge capacity addition going on as we speak in the northeast of USA with offshore wind farm, almost 10 giga um, board of energy is being planned to be generated by offshore wind farms. But they are also utilized, you know, in the roadway system kind of a micro micro wind farm. And now we are implementing, um, you know, with electrification uh, that we are seeing in, in the, the vehicles, uh, cars and transit. Um, there is also now um, consideration for induction charging. So you don't have to have somebody plug it in. You know, when a bus or a truck is waiting you know, through induction system, it can it should be able to charge. There is also a conversation about when a vehicle is traveling just through a pavement, it should be able to charge through induction. So a lot of innovation uh, going on, exciting times for you all to be graduating um, in a couple of years. Um, keep an eye on as we are seeing trucks getting, um, you know, electrified. One of the biggest emissions that happen in, in the global logistics industry, freight industry is from ships. Ships still consume the dirtiest, the most dirty fuel in the whole refining system, right? So the bunker fuel is at the bottom. After everything goes away, the aviation fuel, the kerosene, diesel, petroleum, and whatnot, the last thing that re remains is the bunker fuel. <laughs> and that bunker fuel goes into the ships. 99% of worldwide ships, everybody uses bunker fuel, but the IMO, um, International Maritime um, Organization and other agencies have set very strict standards now to reduce the emission by 2050. So a lot of shipping lines are looking and implementing how to reduce the emissions either by using alternative fuels, e-methanol. Um, there is a lot of talk about using ammonia and hydrogen for, for driving these the ships. Um, this company is, is my favorite, uh, Kongsberg out of Norwegian. This ship is Yara, is a small ship, completely um, electric battery powered ship. So if you want to dream big, dream big and visualize how you can convert all the ships to, to battery powered ships. A um, lot of innovation in terms of, you know, also creating smaller terminals with portal crane frames, minimizing handover cost and using Intracoastal waterway, waterways, marine highways to move containers instead of using trucks um, and, and trains because water is the cheapest and most environmentally friendly mode of transportation despite using bunker fuel. Okay. So it is still better to use waterways. Um, 
for marine transportation. Um, there's other things going on in the industry. Um, you can see when a ship arrives, you need a lot of uh, lot of energy and power to tie that ship. These are huge ships, 1,400 to 1,500 long, double the size of your football field, right? Those ships, you know, they have to be berthed safely. So people are putting new systems where you can actually have a vacuum pad. And when a ship comes, it will just suck it up. Um, but a bit expensive system. Um, I mentioned about that, that um, cone that has to be removed. So um, there are, you know, innovation going on using robotics to remove that cone using robot. So you don't mix human with the machine in an, in an automated environment. The terminal tractors um, are getting electrified. Uh, nice looking terminal tractor, isn't it? I would not want to put it in, in inside a terminal, um, but that's how it looks for, for a terminal. Um, they are testing in, in Gothenburg. This is a automated truck in China. I visited one in Thailand, completely automated, battery operated works very well. Also now, you know, with logistics, you, you want to optimize everything. So you want to optimize how do you plan the warehouse, the cold storage, the cross docking facilities, because this is the big hub. So how do you also further reduce that last mile connectivity and create a, a logistics park Dubai does this a lot, right? So they came up with a logistics park concept, um, expanded upon it huge, big time. But everybody else is doing. Um, this one is also in Europe, in Port, Port of Rotterdam, where, you know, how can you, you know, streamline the, the movement of containers from your terminal to, to land side, uh, et cetera. So those innovations are also going on. And also, this is latest, it's a bit more expensive system yet to be kind of become more mainstream, but why not put it all in a, in a warehouse type system? Um, so you have selectivity does not become issue. With, it, with an existing system, if you wanna pick up a co container at the bottom, you have to lift all on top before you go to the bottom one, right? So there are some rehandling moves, but with such a system, um, you can actually, optimize that also you can see another shot of a warehouse system so you can get to any any container but the problem is the weight so heavy so much steel it just costs too much money so what is better do you do this yes if you are hong kong singapore miami places where there is no additional land available you go higher right um but if you are, you know, a terminal where you can expand land side, then this, this is not an option. <clears throat> so this I think covers, I'm gonna leave some time for question. Um, Jasmine and um, Atilio. Um, yes. Uh, okay, so thank you, Mr. Vijay for your presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them uh, on the on the chat, and we, we can read it for you, or you can just unmute yourself and ask. Um, so I, I have one question myself. Um, Please go ahead. So you know, when it comes to automation, you know, we have you know a, a growing number of you know either smart parts or, or semi semi automated parts in you know Europe, Asia, and you were mentioned as well uh, the. Um, you know, and, and some specific uh, countries from uh, the Middle East. And since you also have a lot of experience with parts here in the U.S., what is your thoughts on the current state of automation here in the U.S.? Yeah, I think there was a milestone contract negotiation that happened in 2002. If you go back, search 
Vesco Sports were shut down for 10 days. I think President Bush was the president at that time. He had to intervene because in 2002, PMA, which is Pacific Maritime Association, who negotiates the contract with ILWU, that was the first time some of those terms were implemented into the contract. So it has taken a long time for the West Coast to begin automating. So West Coast is far ahead um, in automation or semi-automation in the US. East Coast is a different union, ILA, International Longshoremen Association. And, and that one is the negotiations don't happen, you know, coast to coast. Um, so individual ports negotiate the terms with union. Um, so that's why you only see New York, New Jersey has one terminal, semi-automated. Virginia was the first one in 2007. <clears throat> but none of, none other, Georgia, anything down from, so Georgia, Charleston, Jacksonville, Port Everglades, Miami, New Orleans, Mobile, Houston, no automation there. But they are planning. It's a slow growth thing. Um, industry is also very cautious. You know, you cannot invest $2 billion in a new terminal, not knowing somebody's gonna shut it down from a union side. So all that consideration has to go, um, you know, go hand in hand. But I think the trend is, um, so the industry has picked up low hanging fruit People mistakenly think automation is all robots. It's not, it's not the case. Automation is just simple processes. So a lot of those processes, when you are coming through the gate, somebody used to tear a print because that was his job to remove the print and hand it to the driver, making $180,000 in 2004. $180,000 a year. If you are a clerk, part of ILWU, your job is to sit there, truck data transaction, remove the ticket, give it to the driver. Those things have kind of gone away now. A lot of things have become automated in terms of processes. Equipment automation is happening slowly, but it's, it's only the trend is gonna go, go towards that. Okay, thank you. And just, uh... You know, you, using this line of automation, uh, just one more question. Uh, do you think that, you know, the fact that, you know, because when you're talking about automation, of course, you're going to take a lot of, you know, jobs that you would have, you know, a workforce, uh, you know, people working. And then, you know, you're putting automation there in their place. Do you think that that's, that's an, a, a barrier that, you know, it's faced when implementing this type of technology? Yeah, it is, it is, it is a barrier. Uh, that mindset that my job will go away is a barrier. But I don't think we have seen, you know, we have seen that trend. In fact, it creates more jobs because you need more people who can manage the IT, um, who can work remotely, there's a more, lot more systems involved, right? So there are new types of jobs. Yeah, it's not the same job available, but if you look at the bigger impact, there are a lot more new jobs that got created. For a lot many people who need those type of jobs, um, the example I gave you of, of, of a girl who could not ever dream about working in a container terminal because she couldn't, she was paralyzed, right? On her feet, she cannot get on the crane, but this new technology allows people to use their skill and still get a job. So it's, it's a myth, somebody has to bust it. Um, uh, I think it depends on what lenses you put on um, to see the world, that's how the world looks. Um, so it is a barrier, but I think um, the industry is only going going to move in a, in a. It always moves towards efficiency. It never yeah. goes back. Mm. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, so let me see here. Again, if you have any questions, you can either unmute yourself or just uh, put your questions in the chat. Uh, I guess there is no other questions. So again, uh, Mr. Vijay, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. I'm gonna pass this into Jasmine uh, for the closing, if that's the case. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Mr. Iberwal for presenting to us and thank you everyone for joining today's meeting. Our next meeting will be August, October 25th. Um, I'll send out the in information through email. And then if you wanna watch Hello. this back on YouTube, it'll be uploaded um, by the end of the week. So if you also want me to um, email you the yes. link, you can also email me as well. Square, square. Thank you all for joining, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me.